What's up, Meta-Nerds? This video is about one of the most powerful ships in the New Republic fleet, the Starhawk. We will do a complete ship breakdown and size comparison, but let's start with its history. After the Emperor's death in 4 ABY following the Battle of Endor, the Alliance to Restore the Republic, aka the Rebels, were able to capitalize on this win and quickly overrun Imperial assets. In 5 ABY, the Battle of Kuat Driveyards would be one of the most important victories for what was now being called the New Republic. With Endor, they killed the Empire's leader and took out their strongest weapon. With Kuat Driveyards captured, the Imperial War Machine was deprived of its most important shipyard, the place that provided the majority of Imperial Star Destroyers. Most of the NR's fleet was holdovers from the Rebel Years, stuff like X-Wings, Y-Wings, and Mon Calamari capital ships, but there was an odd new ship that stood out. With a front like an axe blade, this bulky yet regal new capital ship commanded respect, but something about it seemed familiar. This was in fact a bit of a homecoming for the Starhawk, as most of the hull and armament of this ship were created right here at Kuat Driveyards. You see, after the Battle of Endor, there were a lot of heavily damaged Imperial Star Destroyers that were just floating around. Besides the Mon Calamari shipyards, the NR didn't have the enormous production capacity of the Empire's numerous shipyards but there was a potential shortcut. The Bormia sector was one of the first to chase off the Imperial Remnant, and deep inside of this sector there was the Nadiri Dockyards. They claimed that they could get an enormous jump on production time by using the parts of these busted up Imperial Star Destroyers to sort of Frankenstein a powerful new fleet killer. But believe it or not, even as the Imperial Remnant was still active and in possession of crucial worlds and production facilities, Mon Mothma was set on demilitarization. She believed that the really important steps had already been done, that the Empire was like a virus, and the remaining parts would be destroyed by the galaxy's antibodies. Luckily, there was Leia, who convinced the new Chancellor that this Starhawk project had to be completed, that they owed it to the oppressed worlds of the galaxy to fight back and put a final end to the Empire. When it was finished, even Mon Mothma was impressed. Officially designated the Nadiri Mark I Starhawk, it sported a refined interior that tried to bring back some of the elegance of the Old Republic era vessels. No more cold and dreary interiors of an Imperial vessel, warm lighting emitted from the walls and even the floors, illuminating the beautiful white scallop ceilings of larger areas like the hangar bays. It was a large, powerful, and highly defended work of art. There are no official stats on its size, but we can actually get a very good estimate because we do know the exact size of the shield generators from the ISD. So that would make the height of the Starhawk around 520 meters, or 1,706 feet tall. That would make it about one and a half Slave Ones taller than the Imperial class Star Destroyer. It would make its length around 1,136 meters, or 3,727 feet. That makes it a Teenage Wookiee shorter than the Venator, and just a bit longer than the Interdictor class Star Destroyer. If it were here on Earth, its height would be in between the Empire State Building and the Burj Khalifa, and it would stretch longer than four times the largest battleship ever built, the Yamato. Now I mentioned the interior of the hangar bays, but there are some discrepancies on the exact amount. It's stated that it only has two, but this looks like one at the four, and it seems like at least two on this side as well. But if we look at the model, we can see that those hangar shapes on the sides are actually three, and mirrored on each side. Then if we look under this main section, we can see what looks like another hangar bay. This elongated section would be perfect for starfighters. But then we can look right under here, and see what appeared to be shallow hangar bays. My guess how to solve this is to think of the Venator. The side-mounted cannons it used for its broadsides were protected by the same kind of blue energy shield that usually denotes a hangar bay. If this area didn't have these Dura-Steel dividers, and was just one big blue shield, one might confuse this area for a hangar. Perhaps these areas on the side of the Starhawk are just massive gun bays. And the front area of this ship is another massive gun bay for directed forward fire, or one of the two hangars that were filled with starfighters. But I actually think this front hangar is more for captured ships. The circular protrusions that ring this area are its experimental tractor beams, which I will explain more in a bit, but that would be an odd place to have your starfighters flying out of. It makes more sense to me that these would be used to easily draw disabled enemy ships right into this forward-facing area. The New Republic actually cares about rescuing damaged vessels and capturing their enemy alive. That of course leaves this thing, which I definitely think is a starfighter hangar. You wouldn't have your guns facing the rear of your own ship, and this way they aren't flying directly into enemy fire. 
these more shallow hangar bays below, perhaps the larger one is a hangar, and the other shapes just look similar. I would assume that they serve various specialized roles, like we see in the Nebulon B. Oh, and these two slits on the front are most likely command areas, much more protected bridges than what we see on the ISD. Now let's talk about its incredible firepower. It is said to be more powerful than your standard Imperial 1 class, but of course the Super Star Destroyer still outguns it. As you can see in this image, the massive broadside attack could be launched with ion cannons, volleys of fire from turbo laser banks, and then a barrage of concussion missile launchers. Most of the firepower seems to be concentrated on the sides, which fits my theory that these shielded areas are just for the weapon banks. As you look at what this ship was intended to do, you really appreciate how form follows function in this amazingly engineered ship. The Imperial Remnant was able to concentrate their Star Destroyers on key worlds, in effect blockading certain areas. At the rear of the Starhawk you see 14 engines in total, 3 primary, 3 secondary, and 8 tertiary. This ship is smaller than the ISD, it has both more engines, and more of a variety of different sizes and placement across the vessel. This means that the Starhawk would have had both greater acceleration and maneuverability, as they could fire all of the engines at full power to quickly rush at the Imperial fleet, but then direct varying amounts of power to different engines in order to turn quicker. I believe this is in part where it gets its name, as it pops out of hyperspace and drops in on its prey. A hawk amongst the stars that uses its heavily armored bow to point directly at the enemy and dive into the battle. A space flyby takes place where the broadside dumps a ton of damage, and the vessel just keeps moving at that fast pace, turning, and then taking another pass. Remember, smaller than the ISD it's fighting, but with more firepower and twice the shielding, four of these projectors instead of two. These shields are concentrated towards the bow, along with the thicker plate armor, so that the Starhawk could confidently fly straight into Imperial formations. But if that wasn't impressive enough, now we have to talk about this ring of tractor beams. Longtime viewers of this channel know that I love the idea of using tractor beams offensively. This is mentioned in some Star Wars novels, talk of an ISD being able to rip apart a ship by pulling it in different directions, stuff like that, but I've never seen a tractor beam array that was purpose-built for offense. They are powered by Magna Batteries, an advanced tech that makes the tractor beams 10 times more powerful than those found in the ISD. You can see that they are massive and centralized into one array, instead of being spread over the ship. This is just another awesome way that this ship is well thought out, as the Starhawk could barrel towards Imperial blockades with that thickly armored, quadruple shielded bow, and simply push ships out of the way. Good luck trying to use fire ships when there's a Starhawk around. This would have been devastating to tiny TIE fighters and transports, but even smaller capital ships like the Arquidans would have been tossed around with ease. The Imperial Star Destroyer would put up a fight, but that's what the Ion Cannons were for. Just as a tiny hammerhead corvette, if perfectly placed, could push around a disabled ISD, after a couple broadside sweeps of the Ion Cannon, the Starhawk was even able to push around Star Destroyers. This ability would prove a deciding factor during the Battle of Jakku. At least one Starhawk was used during the assault on Kuat, but now, in the final battle of the Galactic Civil War, three of these powerful new ships were available. Charging through the lines of Imperial Star Destroyers, they dealt enormous amounts of damage with this strafing tactic. But one of the ISDs, the Punisher, realized it was outgunned and rammed into the Amity, destroying both ships and killing everyone on board. This did, however, open up the ranks a bit so that both of the remaining Starhawks could dive at the massive Executor-class Super Star Destroyer, known as the Ravager. This vessel was the key to Palpatine's contingency plan, but after multiple passes, the SSD was still holding together. Other NR ships combined to severely damage it, but it stood firmly in its place, defiantly striking down the glorified rebel scum one after another. Commodore Agate pushed the Concorde towards the Ravager, and directed all the other ships to focus fire on the SSD's engines. This, combined with barrages from her ion cannons, gave her her only shot at taking this giant down. Directing maximum power to the tractor beam array, the temporarily disabled Ravager started to budge. Slowly, it came out of position, out of orbit, and now into Jakku's atmosphere. At any moment, the SSD could spring back to life, but by now, gravity was helping to literally bring the Empire down. But just as she feared, some of the engines spurted back online. Luckily though, the sporadic firing only worked to seal the Ravager's fate. The combination of forces caused the behemoth to flip onto its back, 
all while the Starhawks kept pushing. Agate wanted to ensure a final end to the Empire, so she never let up, and so the Concorde followed the SSD into its sandy tomb, a place that would come to be known as the Graveyard of Giants. This was a painful loss, but with the Ravager eliminated, the NR was able to mop up the rest of the Imperials, winning the battle and ending the Galactic Civil War with the signing of the Galactic Concordance. The Starhawk would continue production for the New Republic, though Mon Mothma's original aim of demilitarization kept this at a very small number. Later, they eventually fell into the hands of Inferno Squadron. While being pursued by the Supremacy, a part of Leia was secretly hoping that Inferno Squadron would return from their mission of rallying up supporters in the Outer Rim, and burst out from hyperspace with a squad of Starhawks. This expectation may very well mean that Kylo Ren's Empire will have a reckoning with a squad that was once an Imperial outfit, flying with vessels that were once part of Imperial Star Destroyers. So that's it for the Starhawk, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. In Legends, there is a New Republic ship called the MC-140 Scythe. The Starhawk looks like a mix of this, the Keldabe used by Mandalorians, and the Nebulon B. The Bormia Sector is right next to the DARPA Sector. DARPA is a US military agency and stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. I think that's a cool parallel since this is one of the most advanced ships in the New Republic fleet. And I really love that this ship is essentially an in-universe kit bash where you mix up models of ships to make a new one, and something that they did for the original trilogy. The ship was released alongside the Onager class for Star Wars Armada, but was originally depicted in the Aftermath trilogy, and the parts about Leia hoping that they would come to her rescue are from the Last Jedi novel. So I actually really like this ship. It seems really well thought out. Its design is derived from its tactics, and that it is a refreshingly awesome thing to see. Really, that's probably because it was described in the battle first, then later the art was made for it. So its function was first, then the artist gave it the form that made the most sense. Almost all other Star Wars ships start by just having to look cool on screen, and then the lore is developed around them. But what do you think of the Starhawk? Do you like the look, the way it was used in combat, and do you think we will see it on the big screen in Episode 9? Definitely let me know in the comments down below. If you want to connect with us, help support the channel, or get your own copies of the reference materials used to make these videos, be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, I always said the tractor beam was one of the most underrated weapons in the Star Wars universe, and the Force will be with you, always.